in other news, um, Otter is evil. And <laughs> I signed up for a free trial for them. And they went, they automatically turned on auto transcription. And I joined, Vincent Arena joined four or five meetings that were on my calendar that like were just like GRC meetings. It joined them. I listened to the transcript and I people were like, hey Vincent, how's it going? They were like talking to me as if I was there. And then they were like, <laughs> people were like, no, that's not actually Vincent. They were like, oh, it's just a transcription service that's taking notes on behalf of Vincent. And then at the end of the meeting, it automatically emailed everyone from me saying, hey guys, here's the notes. And then people were like, whoa, this is so cool. It's our whole transcript on Otter. And I was like, they're literally using me to like <laughs> push their product. And that setting was turned on automatically. And it joined a bunch of meetings and recorded the transcript of the whole thing without me even knowing. And like, I listened, it was kind of creepy, honestly. I was like, if they're doing this on my behalf, what are they doing with the... <laughs> Talk the about fuck? surveillance capitalism. I mean, that's their model, <laughs> but oh my gosh. Like, they know you're good for their A-B testing, so they pick you. And the other thing they did was they require you to automatically record Zoom videos when the meeting starts by like, to in order to enable their automation. So like Jonathan and I had a meeting and it, it automatically started recording. And I was like, wait, what? It was like, oh yeah, in the instruction video, like that was a mandatory part of the setup. I'm done ranting about Otter. Hey, Otter, if you're listening, um, we don't like this. <laughs> we used to like you when you were free, but not anymore. I still really like their service, but I just can't get over the fact that they uh, <laughs> so blatantly, um, it feels, that was the first time I felt like a tool actually like did something to me that was like against my, <laughs> Well, you know, it didn't feel like there was any sort of consent. So it was a blatant disregard for consent. So it's something different and less evil. Um, uh, Netlify's free account is a little bit more restricted now. Um, you can, you, you can't, uh, you can't connect private repos. Uh, you have to, you have to have a paid account to, mm -hmm automatically build private repos, which, which is kind of fair. And you can still, um, you can still use the free account to build public repos. So um, most of the massive wiki stuff is still safe. What are you okay. using Netlify for, Pete? Um, I use it a ton. Um, uh, uh, what I use it for is hosting static websites like Massive Wiki. Um, mm. I've also got some other, uh, I've got another static site generator called Super Simple and, and that builds HTML websites, it, it, websites from HTML rather than websites from Markdown. Um, uh, it's super cool. Um, you can set it up, like all the Massive Wikis um, get built automatically every time you push um, updates to GitHub. Um, there's a GitHub hook that, that triggers Netlify and Netlify grabs all the new files and rebuilds the site. Um, so you can, you can deploy a massive wiki to the web without running any code on your computer and, and it's all automated. It's very cool. Yeah, that's cool. And then Netlify has a CDN and, you know, their um, websites are highly available around the world without any trouble. Um, it's got let, Let's Encrypt in, um, integrated, so you get HTTPS kind of automatically, magically, and you don't have to worry about that. It's really sweet. Yeah, I used it a few years ago for some simple static websites, and I haven't looked back. Uh, I mean, I, I just put them out there. I haven't looked at them in a few years, so they're probably still working. <laughs> yeah, probably. The other thing they've done, um, uh, I, we're using it for some client work too. So I've got, actually got a paid account. But then once you have 
more than one person checking into the GitHub. Um, they they want to have a team member in Netlify uh, for each person doing check-ins in GitHub. So they kind of try to upsell you that way too. It's like, hey, you know, um, Alexa just pushed the thing to GitHub. You know, just click this button to upgrade to Adam. <laughs> You know, another 19 bucks uh, per seat, and uh, and the thing will just go through. And it's like ah. So that feels it. It's it's still kind of a pain in, in pain in the rear for me um, because I don't need more team members, um, and we can work around. You know, like I can be the one to push it if if that's what it takes. But um, but for for an enterprise you know setup where the cost of Netlify per team per per seat is not that big of a deal. You know, it's like, yeah, you should do that. So I'm curious, like, does it add actions into your repository to do the work to automatically push your code, or is it you initiating a push? Um, it's uh, I push to GitHub, and then there's a action on GitHub that fires right. to tell Netlify that there's new stuff. Um, Netlify goes and grabs the stuff, and then massive wikis um, have a little hook that that tells you what code to grab. Um, the massive wiki builder code. Okay. So Netlify has actually got like a whole build environment, it's like a virtual computer, um, uh, and they cache them, which is really insane. But um, I mean, it's insane because mm -hmm. for every every wiki I've got, there's a cached environment ready to go to build nice. it. Nice. You know? So um, they, if if there's a, a pre-existing cache, they just load that cache and then mm -hmm. into a vir into a virtual computer and and it runs through all the scripts and does whatever. You can do Node and and Go and oh, wow. PHP and Python and I didn't realize you could do all that. Yeah. So it's a full-blown build environment. Wow. So. Okay, so it's probably installing a GitHub action when you set it up to point to your account. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so it handles all that. That's yeah. nice. And is anyone using GitHub projects to manage work? No. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just set up a very simple one for Mark's MX just so we keep track of thoughts of what we want to do with it. But uh, I see people yeah. are using it for complicated stuff too, <laughs> big teams. Um, I, I've been using GitHub for most of this stuff, and it's it's sweet. But uh, since they got by Microsoft, um, and the, some of the stuff, I Copilot was was one of the ones that didn't bother me as much as it bothered other people. But there's a there's a few people who are saying let's get it, get off GitHub. Um, so um, I I kind of intend. I actually I expect uh, CSC. Um, you know the same thing that I run that runs. Uh, matter most. I expect that to be setting up a git uh, git t server as a commons thing, you know, rather than GitHub uh, subsidiary of Microsoft. And kind of the larger story of Microsoft is it looks to me like they're enclosing and to other people, it looks like they're trying to enclose uh, open source software. Um, so TypeScript is a Microsoft thing, and it's super popular um, and super easy to use. GitHub is a Microsoft thing, and it's super popular and super easy to use. And VS Code is super popular and super easy to use. So they've made all these, like, they've lowered barriers for people to be doing open source as long as you're using Microsoft ecosystem. And it's like, yeah. In, in Netlify's case, um, it's, it's a very similar concept, but um, uh, the cache is actually stored on disks. Um, and the thing that, that, that it gets you is that um, uh, it when it first starts, um, it installs a bunch of libraries and stuff like that. It's kind of like setting up a computer for the first time. Um, it's not as fancy as Windows or something like that, but there's a fair amount of stuff that's set up on on the, the virtual computer. Um, so instead of, so it makes it faster if you don't do that setup every time. So what it does is it gets all the files set up and then it saves it in a folder for me um, for, for my project. Each of my projects has a separate folder. Um, and, then, and then it can pretty quickly just, it, instead of 
instead of like rebuilding a whole computer every time, it just turns on the computer, connects uh, the computer to the, the hard drive, the virtual hard drive, and it's got all the libraries ready to go. So it doesn't do any library installation. It just, um, it just rebuilds what it needs. It's faster. So is that called serverless these days? <laughs> I, you know, I, <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to tell. I, I don't even. It's not like ser serverless <laughs> is. is well, it's uh, like you don't know what server it's running on, but it's spinning it up and keeping it hot for you. If you <laughs> it's similar to serverless. Yeah, I, I think yeah. of serverless like AWS Lambda, where okay, you run, which which actually is kind of the same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, and then who's paying for the cost of those machines? Like, are they micro billing for that, or <laughs> yeah, like how um, do they make money? <laughs> it's their paid accounts. Huh? Oh yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, like what are they running on Amazon or underneath? Or, you know, uh, or... I actually don't know. Huh. Probably one of those things, Amazon or or Google or. Microsoft so, or yeah, maybe they got a good deal for hosting all this, all these machines. Yeah, they, uh, it's a it's a loss leader. The the free accounts are you know mm. loss leaders. Yeah. Um, so and it's a it's a good marketing thing, you know, because if I was doing enterprise stuff, I'd be like, hey, we got to use Netlify because it's a lot easier. Um, right. So like for your dev test stuff, you could use their own URLs, but uh, if it's enterprise, you'd want a custom URL, and they can they do that. Um, even for the, the free accounts, use custom URLs. Yeah. Okay. And and they do a good job of, of kind of managing the domain stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, my main reason was I wanted to get off GoDaddy. <laughs> yeah. And that, that, that helped. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the dom domain stuff uh, with Netlify has been magic. It just mm -hmm. works. It's yep. really awesome. Cool. Is there anything we want to talk about Flotilla, like what's been going on or recently? Or... I had kind of an interesting dilemma um, putting together this week's biweekly Plex dispatch. Um, the idea of it was it was supposed to be kind of, you know, where does where does the Plex live? Where where do we meet and congregate? And I had Flotilla Friday as one of the one of the, the places where you know you can see the Plex, and it's more than just you know uh, two people talking about a particular project. Um, I ended up it it kind of fell below some line of size or or something like that, or or general interest or something, and I I I didn't end up putting Flotilla Friday as one of the things that. Because then there's other things too, like Massive Wiki Wednesday. It could be another you know like that, but. Um, that's very tiny. It's mostly just me and Bill. So it's like um, the newspaper days. Like if you want it in big masthead or <laughs> on the right side of the paper. <laughs> yeah. I, um, I, I, uh, I, I guess I'm going to, I feel like I'm going to revisit that format again, you know, in some months or something like that. So maybe, maybe we'll have, I, I guess there's a, it's it's tiers, you know, the big tiers are uh, OGM and, and Meta Project maybe, and then, you know, some smaller ones and then smaller and smaller, mm -hmm. so. This is bringing me back to my school days uh, doing desktop publishing on old Macintoshes. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, in university, uh, I worked for the, the student newspaper and we had a Phototyped setting machine, which was really fancy in the day. Um, laser, you know, laser printer essentially, but it printed um, little little chunks of articles, and we actually did paste up with wax, hot wax, and stuff mm. like that. So it'd come off the phototype setter, and you know, you nice. cut it out and wax the back and stick it down. <laughs> cool. And there's a guy in Maryland who has a museum with a real linotype machine. So you can see him melting lead and pouring it in and <laughs> making the fonts. It's hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> and he burns himself and whatever. The, uh, the, the, one of the perks of working for the student newspaper, uh, it was called Grafton Corruption. Um, you could, 
uh, you could like when nobody was looking kind of or they looked the other way you could photo type set something like you know like a, a name label for your door or something like that you know mm -hmm. which was you know like wow you you got that typeset oh my god yeah remember we stuck in a cartoon that wasn't approved uh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, jonathan, did, jonathan yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Well, I, I'm kind of curious since I've a, only attended a few of these flotilla meetings. What's what's the purpose of flotilla? Am, is it too late to ask that? No, not at all. The um, the 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 subhead for flotilla for flotilla is tools for connectors. Um, the idea of flotilla is uh, kind of a group of um, makers. Um, so, uh, Factor, uh, Catalyst, Trove, um, Massive Wiki, uh, talking about how we might do interoperation, basically, and directories and matchmaking and stuff like that. So, it's, it's kind of technically, it's a, you, you can almost think of it as a uh, special interest group around the idea of directories and matchmaking, um, and uh, it's got a technical focus. And uh, interoper uh, interoperability is one of the big things that we kind of do. Interesting. So, some, so sometimes we we kind of, a, as Flotilla, we end up talking about interoperability in, in other contexts. Uh, so, you know, in the context of OGM or Meta Project or something like that, it's we'll refer back to Vincent will or Michael will or I will say, Oh, over in Flotilla, we've talked about making sure that Catalyst can can export to Massive Wiki, and you know, Factor can export to Catalyst, and you know, all the ways all the ways around. So I think my overlap here would be um, how to present the information that you're talking about in mm -hmm. ways that isn't overwhelming. Yeah. So cool. So now I know I'm here. <laughs> right on. Um, you. you should do a demo, Eric. OK. Um, the other comment is um, at the Render conference this past Tuesday, there's a reading app. I forget the exact name, but it did integration like with Evernote and several other places. And it seems like they did the hard stuff of <laughs> figuring out how to talk to each of these things into their notebook app. Is that Readwise or? Yeah, Readwise. That's it. I, I, there may be something, you know, it's all jumbled up in my mind. Uh, yeah. So <laughs> it's a six hour video for anyone who wants to watch. <laughs> okay. Um, what I want to show is what I've been playing with. Um, I've been using Mark's MX system just to track my thoughts and link them up and uh, come up with some kind of demo. But what I've been thinking more about is how I can use hypercores to for my own purposes and then potentially expanding it out for sharing thoughts with people. So let me share my desktop. Okay, Zoom takes it over. Okay, so um, can people see like the four things on my screen? Yes. Good. Okay, so down here is Mark's MX system running in DOSBox. So that was a first hurdle, how to get a Fox Pro system from 1984 to run. Okay, really so cool. yeah. You, you might want to tell us what MX is a little bit. Okay, well, it, Mark has, uh, he it's like Mark's idea for Memex, or you could say that it was the MX missile. He was a counter to the MX missile in the 1980s, but it's really his thought collection system. And he came up with this rambling idea where your thoughts just display in random order when it's not doing anything. So yeah, you could stop it, but the, the idea is your mind will catch onto a word or two and think something adjacent to that. But I'm just gonna hit the space bar to stop it. And here's a new poem by Emily Dickinson made up of the first lines of several other poems. Okay, but it's more than just that. Like if I hit tab and tab, you could see a whole bunch of stuff that I've already put into the system over the past two weeks. Okay, so, um, but what I wanna demonstrate 
So like drawing on that Emily Dickinson theme, so Apple has a TV series. So if I type Emily colon and then I capital D and hit tab, it matches to the first match. And then I want to look at season three. And now here are all the thoughts that are linked to season three. So there's all the episode titles. And then here's one called Attachment URLs 3. So right now this is like, I'm doing this all manually, but say there was a way that this can now, if you clicked it to bring up a URL. Well, so I figured like you would have a local directory with all your MX attachments and it could be seeded onto a hyperdrive, which is um, the hypercore protocol. And just to show you the directory structure, so this is in DOSBox, and I figured under the DOSBox directory, I'll create a hyperdrive directory for all the hyperdrives that are related to my DOSBox applications. And then I decided to create a private, public, and shared, because um, it's all based on the keys. So this hyperdrive here has a key, and um, let's, in the public, so the public version of this is all the attachments that and this readme file. And this is what's in the public hyperdrive. So I have an audio directory, I have text directory, a video directory, and I have RTF files just because I'm on a Mac. And I have an up and a down shell scripts. So let me just show you cat up.sh. So the way this works is say I add um, a file into this directory, like if I do a copy of my tweets. Okay, and now I do run up.sh. It just compared my local copy with the copy in the hyperdrive. So right now on my Mac somewhere, there is an official directory with all the hypercore data structures. And it determined that if I commit this, it will add the tweets copy to this hyperdrive. And I could say yes. And now it just committed that change. So now from my laptop here, it is seeding it to whoever knows this address. And these addresses could be abstracted. And I'll show you an example of that later. But um, so um, in another system, they call it pet names. So like say I say MX attaches my pet name and then there's some mapping to this hex key, but that's the key, it's a public key. And it um, identifies this directory around the world. Okay, so I have another laptop in my basement that is looking for any changes I make to this. And by me committing it, it has already copied those changes to the laptop in the basement. And that is only seeding, which means that it is communicating with the DHT, the distributed hash table around the world. And anyone who is looking for this key, wherever they are, they will ask a peer, do you have it? If not, uh, the, the, they'll connect to another peer from the peers that that one knows. And eventually they'll find the laptop in my basement, which can serve them the files. So it, you, so I created a down cat down that sh, which will take the difference between the hyperdrive on the network and my local directory and optionally commit it. It always asks yes or no if I wanna commit it, but it will show me what I would be bringing down. So I'm in control. It, like I don't need to have things pushed to me and then not know that I got them. And I'm in control of this local directory, whatever I wanna do in it. So like here is output from the MX system. See, because it's in DOSBox, it's writing the files to a directory. So like here, if I type control O, it prints an out.txt file. And then I could just copy that somewhere else. So like this is from August 18th. And so this is when I was, um, yeah, re that was yesterday and I was playing around. Okay, how do I wanna use this to reference a hyperdrive? So I figured, let me make it bigger. So here, um, okay, so like you see, I, I made up my own tags 
And um, it's very flexible. You do whatever you want. I mean, you could put in a URL like this, or you can say, okay, go to an attachment of URLs and pick the first one. So I'm still in the process of designing how I want it to work, but I've come up with some ideas that we could walk through. But what I want to show you first is how I can use this. Um, so say I wanted to drill more into that season three. Okay, so let me run it again, um, MX. Okay, so this is a development version. I'm working with Mark on getting get. Uh, into a form that he's happy with for people to start playing with it. So it starts up, you have a blank screen. How beautiful. So here I, I'm interested in Emily Dickinson season three. And now I'm just going to stop it and pick an episode. And the one that I want is, where is it? This is my letter to the world. So you could type the number nine and um, I don't know if there's a way I could just flip it up to the top, but I'm going to type this is my and hit tab. Okay, so these are all the things that I have connected to that thought. Now, Emily is the parent thought, so that's automatically connected when I created it, and it was created 7.57 a.m. yesterday. But underneath it, I've linked Emily Dickinson's, well, this is also a parent in season three, but I've added references because Walt Whitman appears in that show, the reference to Yorp and Leaves of Grass and a tweet that I did. So let's see, what would that tweet be? Well, if somebody downloaded my hyperdrive, I just have to get out of this. Uh, yeah, okay, so to get out of the DOS box capturing my mouse. <laughs> Let me move this down here and exit that. Okay, so I wanna see what is that tweet. So whoever, if, so imagine there was a way that it could send a command to open this tweets file and see entry number one and then copy this URL and go to a browser and look up that tweet. And here's my tweet about it. <laughs> so I was convinced that uh, this, um, video, Emily da <laughs> Emily dancing at a gay bar, the Walt Whitman character was a guy, Jason Scott from the Internet Archive, because he sounded just like him. So here, and then I've expanded on it, uh, posting my video about Emily Dickinson. So think about that. Um, it's like the navigation that Jerry would do. But now let's look at YOP. So let me uh, hit escape and type ref YOP and uh, hit enter. So these are the connections to YORP. So here I have in my hyperdrive a video number two and a video number one and a URL number four. And uh, this is the parent, okay? So this could be visualized uh, differently, of course. So now let me get out of that and let's go to um, the URL. So URLs and the number that I want here is um, number four. And now I'll copy this URL. The others are like, if I want to see the seasons, uh, more information about each season, it's a quick way of me finding that. So it's however I want to organize my information and whether I want to share some of it or wh whatever I want to do with it, share it with a group or share it like just with Mark Carranza, whoever. Okay, so let's paste uh, control V, command V. Uh, what am I doing? I'm trying to copy the URL. Okay, so I want this because this is an article. Okay. Safari, the address is invalid. What did I do wrong? Oh, HTTPS. Okay. So here, Stanford Unity Press has a book, The American Yawp. And I never knew that. I found that searching Google and I decided, hey, I want to save that link if I want to ever read that book or any or get a preview of it. Okay, so that's we, now let's look at videos. So there there are two links to videos. Let's go to the video directory. And okay, so that's the directory, but uh, this text file videos.rtf. Now see this could also be a hypercore which is an append only log, which would automatically add blocks to the hyper course. Like my first block could just be this text, which is a link to a YouTube video at a specific time. 
So I can just paste that in here for now. And you could see here is Dead, Dead Poets Society, Robin Williams, um, that scene where he talks about Yorp to his class. And it's a funny scene. So now say I wanted to like comment on it, like cut a piece of that and comment on it. So I was thinking, okay, what could I put in this file? Well, I could put JSON in it and then have a program to interpret the JSON. So I just came up with this for now, hype colon MX attach colon video. Well, that tells me it's in this MX attach folder and it's under the video directory. And um, here is the file name, Dead Poets Society, exactly as I download it from YouTube. And then start at one minute and 18 seconds. So if I had an app locally, I could fast forward it. And here is the point, uh, the point of the video where it would start. Okay, now let's think about audio. So the use case for audio is um, I'm using this little recorder to record my thoughts when I'm away from the computer. And then I put them all into an MP3 file. Oops, let me uh, move this out of the way. Okay, going back. Um, yeah, so under the audio, I have an audio file here. So if I could have a hype MX attach audio and a file and a start time, so like if we had like zero, 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 people could start the audio at a specific time. So think about this allowing transclusions. So people could synchronize my hyperdrive to their PC and play with it offline. And then if you have a language that can play an audio file at a specific starting point, they can take this on a plane and play this audio file and it'll open up in, in in Apple Music or whatever music player they have. And this is like the thoughts that I recorded on the, the 16th. So here's my readme.txt. I'll make it bigger. So let's just see if there's anything I haven't touched on yet. Um, yes, yeah, so this is the hyperdrive for referencing attachments and um, the out.txt is an example. So I've been using this to save every day all my thoughts to get them out of that Fox Pro system into text files. And I renamed the text file with the date and it's in my own hyperdrive, which is private. If I wanna share something with somebody, I'll show, I'm gonna show you an example of that. For, like say, I wanted to create one for Flotilla. So there's always bi-directional links. Whenever you use the MX system and you create a title, and you create like all the um, children under it, it's always a bi-directional link. So this is linked to that episode title, the other episodes in season three and the parent. This is my letter to the world has the references. So tag meanings are user defined and they could be undocumented or later I'll get around to documenting them. Uh, here's a reference example. So I thought of using a deaf link. Um, so it's like me making up my own language of how I want to organize my stuff. And anyone could do that for themselves. If there is a standard app that's created, the app could probably handle the creation of the tags. I mean, this could take it taken a million different ways. But here's my definition, a reference to an attachment file stored in a hyperdrive. And uh, so I was playing around with what I'd want to store, like the tweet and the tweet. Uh, so yeah, tweet number one, and this references the tweets file. So this is what I consider an alias, because I don't want to put that 64 byte hex string into uh, <laughs> the MX. And here's the YOP linked to a video and the URL, which I showed you. Uh, for URLs, yeah, that's the example I showed you. And the video, the RTF, so video two is a local copy of a YouTube video clip and JSON could be in the entry. So we could rethink how those entries are stored. I mean, in a hypercore, you could store anything. So maybe JSON is the standard format for everything in the hyperdrive, but it's up to us to design if we want to. Thought recording and replay, I showed you the audio and uh, the attachment tags can have synonyms defined by links, but you may want to edit the data to remove synonyms eventually. So like I started with like ATT URL and I decided, okay, I want hype as this new standard, but for now I could have synonyms that link these together. 
And that reminds me of Ted Nelson's cloning in um, his uh, zigzag system. So the documentation, yeah, I removed all the ATTs, but the data was not edited. So see, I have, uh, I'm a little out of sync with my actual data in MX. And I showed you the shell script up and a local Linux server subscribes to the owner, receives all changes and seeds them out to the world. So what I wanna show you now is say, I wanna create a flotilla hyperdrive, all I have to do for that. So let's do this. Let's go to a terminal. Okay. So I'm gonna go dot, dot. So here's my public, that's the only public hyperdrive. And I posted that in the decentralization on Mattermost. So let's go to shared. Okay, so here I have a directory called Mark Carranza, CD Mark. And in here I have a video that of a call we did and I can send that up to him or he could download it. We haven't tested that yet, but I'd like him to. Okay, but now here, let's go to Flotilla. Okay, so all I have here are two videos and that's what I wanna share. Well, I'm going to create a new hype, hyperdrive. Now, HYP is the hyperspace hyperspace protocol, and that gives you these uh, commands, and there's a daemon running in Node. This is Node.js, and version 14 is the one that works. Newer versions, there's some issues, so I, down, I used NVM to get to Node 14. So let me just show you hype daemon status. Okay, so this is showing that um, my daemon is running and uh, this is my IP address and a hole punchable. So there's a company that just started called Hole Punch and they're gonna extend this whole hypercore protocol into something new that hasn't been announced yet, but keep an eye on it, Hole Punch. <laughs> All right, because that means that um, it's finding ways to get around your um, home router behind whatever ISP you have, whatever firewall they, they put up. So it's magic. So here are the two files I want to share with Flotilla. So I'm going to give do a command hype, drive, create, and I'm going to send the two, which is the error output. That's just what happened where they put it. I want to send that to an up.sh. Okay, now cat up.sh. Oh, hype create drive, okay? So hype create drive. So this is the command line interface that people can play with, which it's not ready for prime time, but people wanna play with it, go ahead. Okay, so it's seeding a hyper drive. Now let me vi up.sh, okay? So it created, this hyperdrive, which is a brand new universal key. It's unique. Um, there's a possibility of a collision like once every million years or so, whatever they, but it, consider it a unique. Now, because it's on this video, anyone who sees this video can type this key in and get to that hyperdrive now and get those video files. So it's up to the users to determine how to share their keys. So I'll post this later in the flotilla uh, so anyone in flotilla can see it. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is edit this. So I'm going to do a hype, whoops, diff. And when I upload, I want to go from my local directory to the hyperdrive, okay? And I could leave hyper in, it, it'll work. I'm just gonna take it out for convenience and then go to the end of the line and get rid of that. And minus C is the commit parameter. So this is a diff. So um, yes, yeah, so let me just run that up.sh. Okay, permission denied. I have to do a change mod uh, U plus X to up.sh and now it'll work. Okay, so it's telling me it's gonna add, well, I have a DS store. I think there's a way to exclude files, but not a big deal. It's gonna add the two MP4 videos and the up.sh and it's committing it. So right now it's storing those um, megabytes of MP4s on my PC first. And then 
my PC in the basement is going to detect it. So see, while I'm on the internet here, it can serve from either my PC or my PC in the basement. Um, if I disconnect my PC here from the internet, it'll still be able to, people still be able to get to my basement and pull the files. So this is taking a little while because it has to really add it all to the hypercore structure, which is, um, it, it's got a, it, it's using um, a Merkle tree. That, that's how it's internally storing all the blocks and it's hashing them and validating that the blocks are consistent. And then eventually gets a, um, th this um, hash here is computed as a public key to the Merkle tree, all right? So there's a hole under the hood that you could find uh, if you wanna learn that. And for convenience, I'm also creating a down. So I'm gonna do a copy up to down. And all I do is reverse. I reverse the dot. So uh, I'm doing a diff between the hyper drive and your local drive. So I put a dot here. And this is so that once you download this, you can just run the down sh for future synchronization. So if I had a new file tomorrow, you could run down sh and you could pull down the new file. So I'm also going to commit this one. So I'm going to do an up sh. Uh, and it's adding down.sh to the hyperdrive and it's there. So um, the video about installing the hyperspace CLI, um, I'm going to post that in our chat so you could see what you have to do to do that. It's just node NVM and node and then installing from their website, they give you the link for that. So I'm gonna stop for now. Okay, any questions? Uh, Jonathan had a question, which is how would this help me? <laughs> and I, I had a quick answer, which is it's sort of like the backend database for a front end that looks like the brain um, along with some the the kind of implicit UI stuff that, that yeah. comes from MX, um, right. which is very fast um, and, and hard yeah. to see if you're not. See, for anyone out. who grew up using uh, DOS and uh, typing on keyboards, typing commands, that fast interface, it's, it's natural for yeah. people, for the kids growing up today with mouses and whatever. <laughs> and, uh, it, the, yeah. uh, how how you would could... you do this with a waxer? <laughs> Waxer? <laughs> oh, to, to cut the wax. <laughs> well, you guys so have an I'm iOS joking. app yet? <laughs> iOS? Uh, it, people have been trying. Um, the mobile platforms change a lot, and it, it could be um, like a progressive web app. Um, so there is, people are using Electron. So there's a whole community playing with this and something new will come out with the protocol in December. So I wanna see what that is. And that's related to the keep.io video chat. So there's some new way where they're saying they don't need the hyperspace demon anymore. So it's evolving uh, as always. So, uh, but here's something useful I just did with it that I could share with anyone who wants to play with it. Um, once Mark approves, <laughs> he's the granddaddy of, yeah, he's open to that. We're just trying to get a good demo out uh, that people can easily play with. So, I was wondering about the the line numbers that you've got to refer to things. In, yeah. And do those ever change? Do you expect them? Okay, to, to... well, he see, when you enter it, that you say you're starting a new topic and then you hit tab and you start typing a bunch of things. Um, you could add as many as you want. So like when I was taking notes, I had like 400 entries and uh, it'll sequence them. It's just that right now, when you go back to a topic and add, it's starting at one. So he wants to fix that. So it'll count the number of entries and add one. So you see the number that you have, but in the output reports, the number on the left is showing the number of links to that thought. So if I have that, uh, episode linked up five times you should see a five to the parents and children linked to that because it's just a simple data uh, it's two tables it's yeah. one with an index and all the thoughts and there's a memo field too in fox pro 
for things over 80 characters. But um, the other table is just uh, the bidirectional links. It's thought A and thought B, and uh, that just pairs of links like that. So it's a freeform graph. And then, yeah, you go ahead. It'd be, uh, it'd be cool to port that to something newer. <laughs> Yeah, um, I mean, the, the concept, people are tr already starting, uh, like Mark Meta guy who's uh, doing his own thing in SQL Lite. So yeah, you could put whatever user interface you want on it uh, yeah. if, you build, if you just get the concept. Hyperspace, good, does Disney cross social with the MCU? Oh, cool, yeah. Yeah, we need hyperspace demons for uh, Halloween. <laughs> uh, could be a good marketing uh, tactic. Yeah, I mean, there's hyperspace uh, trademarked. Or, I don't know. <laughs> As someone who did not grow up with this mm -hmm. kind of stuff, um, at first, my thought was just like, why? <laughs> my my initial thought was just like, but, but it's not on the internet. Why is it on your computer? Why are you using the terminal? And then like, as I'm watching, I'm like, oh, okay, it's actually really beautiful in the sort of mm -hmm. simplicity it's building I'm your in. own internet. Your yeah, own cloud. yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, well done. It, it's, mm. yeah, it's tougher. It's like a, it's kind of a mind. Uh, yeah, you got to wrap your mind around it. But uh, see, like, I need to know what happens under the hood in these tools that I use. And here I know what is happening. It's a Fox Pro indexing database. And uh, I know where my files are. With Apple, Google, I have no idea what they're doing to my computer, you know, <laughs> Microsoft, whatever. Yeah, so that I totally get the why, just not the how. Yeah, I mean, until these protocols really stabilize and become more standardized and the marketplace accepts them and starts building on them, I mean, who knows what's going to arise? It's going to be Tim Berners-Lee's solid protocol or whatever. But I see a, there's room for everybody in this space. I mean, this could be a niche product or, um, I mean, people are, exper there's a whole creative community experimenting with the, like the Beaker browser and secure Scuttlebutt and fun stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I totally think that the, I mean, what I mean about, you know, totally getting the why is um, that that lots of people want this, and the idea that it could be wrapped and and you know the interface for it could be something simple for people who need something simple. You can have multiple applications yeah. working on the same data. Yeah, so you build yeah. different. Thing, and someone who needs accessibility, you build it into the app. You don't distribute that to everybody and blow it up your software, you know? Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, do it, you know, I mean, like I can, yeah. I can, I can completely imagine uh, a voice interface yeah. for, you know, for some of the- Yeah, yeah. I mean, if this yeah. had voice recognition and could just send text, that'd be nice, but it's an old one. There are new ones that do it if you want to spend the money. Huh. Yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of ways this can go, and I'm just keeping uh, notes in Mark's GitHub. So he's got a private repo for now, and he's, we have a GitHub project just to brainstorm ideas, and we'll have meetings uh, when we decide when. <laughs> yeah, so, and I'm dreaming about well, how could Ted Nelson's ZZ structure be put into this graph? And I think quite easily because it's just adding a restriction on the graph to make sure that you're of a left neighbor and a right neighbor and no other loops or tangles. So whatever I've been playing with the, before, I can now have a nice tool, but I'm, I'm enjoying using the tool because it's natural to me. That's because I'm a geek who grew up in with DBase in high school. I think it's, it's not hard to learn. Um, no, if people and, want uh, to, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, sure, but but the idea is your data is your own. It's on your drive, backed up on your network, and only people who have the key can get to it. So if I give you the key, and 
you can see it, but if you start, if I trust you and then you give the key to someone that I don't trust, well, that's part of the problem, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, but uh, it's really, yeah, so key management's a tricky one and decentralized identity, of course. So, so the um, thing that Gordon presented at the uh, Tuesday yeah, event, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's calling it. Uh, well, is Noah Sphere is one is what he talked about, but he just has another one, which is going to be a mobile app for note taking. So yeah. I connected to him on the Discord. So oh, cool. um, yeah, and I put up one issue saying, "Okay, uh, are you thinking about IP anonymity?" Because, <laughs> like, say you had a community and uh, you, they're planning a protest and they wanna keep secret messages between each other. Yeah. How you know that the police aren't gonna track their IP addresses and find the ringleader. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and I, I love that presentation. It was really interesting. Oh yeah, he was cool. And, uh, yeah, um, yeah, it got me thinking a lot. So, and they're doing Rust and IFPS. So they could coexist alongside this. It's a free, ecosystem that's uh, whoever niche users want to go with. Uh, I mean, the developers can have a field day doing whatever they want with this. It's just a question of, uh, yeah, how do we make it marketable or into products that people can, like Stacy and her community can use? <laughs> do you yeah. know um, uh, uh, Johannes Ernst and um, Ernst. Uh, uh, Project like Dazzle. Um, do do you, do you know Johannes? I know I know his name, but not. Yeah, um, they're just doing some stuff that's a little bit more hardware based. Right. But I was talking to them. I mean, I've been talking to them, and and I was telling them about the render conference from a non technical you know, point of view. But um, I think you'd be interested in what they're doing. Um, I'll. And yeah, post the link. I'll post a link. Um, cool. Eric, yeah. if you're um, maybe, maybe you are, maybe you aren't, that uh, public key uh, hypercore thing, it reminds me of uh, Apple's AirTag system and the way it works. Could be. Um, uh, I dropped a link to Open Haystack, uh, which mm -hmm. is a reverse engineer of it. Um, it's mm. pretty cool. Oh, nice. The, um, the uh, AirTag, um, and they made they've made open you know open clones of AirTags basically. Mm -hmm. um, it is continually saying, "Hey, I'm here. Hey, I'm here," and then iPhones that walk past uh, mm -hmm. hear it, yeah. and then they uh, use the public key and in encode the location of the iPhone. Mm -hmm. and then upload it to the Apple Cloud. Yeah. So you can download, uh, somebody, people are starting to use that for, for transmitting tiny bits of data. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you can use the Apple thing because all of it's encrypted. You know, Apple doesn't know what's going on. Um, it's peer to peer. Okay. Um, no, or not. And it, so well, it's Apple you, servers. Can, yeah. you can ask for, tell me, you know, here's the public key, tell me what you've got. and and. Uh, anybody can download it, but nobody can decrypt it unless you've got the private key, right? So yeah, um, that's that's how how the whole thing works. Yeah, I mean, this is end to end encrypted. So yeah, yeah. that hyperdrive on my machine, it's uh, it, it uses a noise protocol it, for encryption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's evolving. It'll keep evolving. And question is, yeah, well. So basically, I'm just putting the ideas out there for anyone who'll listen and demos and stuff until we see where this goes. Uh, I mean, the whole world is thinking this way of Web three. And um, thanks, thanks for helping Mark or oh yeah, picking up Mark Runs and stuff. Sure. Um, uh, for the folks who did, weren't there at the OGM call, the tail end of the OGM call this week, um, Mark was ecstatic uh, <laughs> that that somebody yep. after thirty plus years has kind of said, oh, wow, look at this. We could do cool stuff with it. Yeah. Um, the other thing we learned was that um, uh, part of this UI simplicity, there's there's a weird thing about when I say simplicity, it is really simple to use that MX interface. Yeah. Um, it's just that there, 
the the thing that makes uh, uh, windows and mice and, and stuff, um, the graphical UI looks simple is that all the controls are visible. Um, yeah. Uh, but it's not simple. It's, it's actually really complex. You have to do a lot of hand eye coordination yes. and target, you know, acquisition and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Engelbart researched use. all that, you know? <laughs> um, so it's self-documenting, but after that, you know, it's self-documenting and it helps you use it for the, or helps well, you learn. Yeah. How like to someone new, program. like going up to a Mac, uh, like say at a music program, you, you could look at the menus you kind of and bumble figure. around and, and right. Right. I mean, but then, Right. Every every minute after that that you spend moving your mouse around and clicking buttons, yes, it's just waste. Wait. It's yeah, it's, it's just... interrupting your flow. Yeah, yeah. So but it depends. If <laughs> you could have a mouse driven interface for this too, if you wanted a you yeah. So yeah. I'm thinking, could we just you put totally all could. the? I I yeah. when it, when you're doing that stuff, it I always think it it's very similar to what Jerry does with the brain, the way he navigates yeah. around. Um, but yeah, anyway, what we learned uh, mm -hmm. Wednesday was Mark's, uh, the simplicity of the MX interface uh, was um, inspired by uh, thinking about somebody being stoned and yep. having to use the interface. You yeah, know, that was like, funny. Okay, so it would be really hard to kind of get, you know, through all the screens and stuff on Microsoft right. Word or whatever. Uh, but, let me type you know. what I'm thinking. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's a good uh, UI design hack. And think about all the people texting. What if you could just text from your phone into MX or a decentralized awesome. version of it? Yeah. Yeah. I, Eric, have you ever seen notational velocity, or or, or NVALL? No. I mean, there's so many things out there. I don't know what to focus it's, on. It's worth all. looking at uh, yeah. NVALT, uh, which okay. is a clone of notational velocity. I don't know if the notational velocity still runs, but it's. It's it's got a similar kind of vibe to it. Um, the idea is it's it's a thought database, um, but you actually it's a it's a it's not linked. I don't think, but you find thoughts mm -hmm. by just typing stuff. Yeah. So you um, to to searching and entering a searching for a a uh, thought or entering a thought is the same interface you're just typing right so similar. if you don't find mm -hmm. it you you type and you hit return right. mm -hmm. so yeah so with mark um one enhancement would be searching in the middle of a thought because in fox Pro, yeah. it's using the seek command which is using an indexed list yeah. of your thoughts so that's the fast seek but uh, you could do a slower seek but um yeah so i'll learn some of his code and improve it a little bit and we'll get it out and people were trying to get it working on the internet archive as a demo um but beyond that i'm thinking yeah like really this whole idea of using a decentralized system for people to store their own thoughts and keep it private unless they want to share pieces of it it's really like a transclusion so like yeah. if i have my full thoughts a to z from the day and I just want to share uh, like M, N, and O with uh, yeah. someone else. Well, I could just create another hyperdrive that has the links to those M, N, and O thoughts. And yeah. then um, whatever I share that that hyperdrive with the three links. Yep. And, and then somebody can pull that into an article they're writing and it can dynamically fetch the links from my laptop in the basement. And then once they have it locally, it can just use it from their machine and then they could synchronize it later when they want to, not auto sync. I mean, yeah. see, I, I like thinking about what's going on. I don't want Apple updating. And yep. I once had a Microsoft money app on a old HP, uh, whatever it was. And I tried synchronizing it and it just changed my money around. <laughs> it was just yeah. crazy, just wrong. <laughs> I've got uh, my wife's iPad right in front of me. Um, it's it's photo storage is full, and it's mm -hmm. supposed to be syncing to iPhotos. Oh no! And, yeah, cloud. You yeah. know, be like automatically making more space, but that's broken. And so I plugged it into my Mac, and I'm trying to get the photos off. And yeah, uh, right. Uh, my Mac says no photos. There's nothing there. Oh no! Oh Even my gosh! <laughs> Eleven gigs on it. You know. Can you so, root? Yeah, yeah, I like I use something called iMazing, which lets you look at the file system on an iPad, and then Thank if you, you can I'll, get it, I'll you could get yeah, iMazing or file uh, app. I've got a, I, I found a random thing called Doctor Phone, which like, oh, here's your mm -hmm. photos, you know. 
Yeah. Now, why are we in this situation where Apple has locked up our data? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that's business. But um, yeah, what would it be like? Like I have a thousand photos that I want to now look at and bring them into my hyperdrive. And then I can use the MX to tag them my way. So yeah. like my visit to Princeton, uh, I'll tag all those photos together. And then when I want to look it up later, I look in MX, find the link and find the directory. And oh, yeah, those are the photos. Yeah. I, I, I like something um, like, go ahead. It, it feels like it. Like you could do the same thing with the brain, but the you brain can. is kind of optimized for its essentially its data types, you know, thoughts and and whatever. Yeah, I see. Made thoughts be able to do. It's really cool that you're going. Oh, and then I could use this. It, it's like you've got the core my of own. the brain. Yeah, I'm designing but, my own linking. But then you can, uh, you know, do whatever you data you want around it. A lot yeah, I mean, easier. the brain is nice for the visualization and the tweening. Yeah. So I could see how Jerry likes that. Um, and I like it for organizing because like I saw those lists of uh, the flotilla meetings so yeah. that that the brain came to mind. OK, I would just go one by one, put it into the brain and link it up the way I think it should be linked. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, the, the idea of being able to link it by, you know, by participant, like, you know, you don't like six months from now. Oh. What was that meeting where Mark Carranza was dancing, you know, with insane? Yeah, jazz, right. Um, and like looking up. Yeah, you know, Mark could go back 38 years and find things. It's amazing. Uh, I love that. And yeah. I was thinking as you were talking about pictures, this is mm -hmm. something that I, you know, very much desire the protocol for is like, okay, you took your, you went on a trip to Princeton, you took pictures mm -hmm. and those are mainly for you and maybe you want to share them with some certain friends right who, you know know that it's you that went there right maybe you also want to share them without attribution to people who are just exploring the space like yeah. you don't want them traced back to you but you're willing to share them publicly yeah like a flicker or something yeah yeah or or even you know even like public, I mean, maybe not public yeah. name, well, but well, that's why certain I, license. Yeah, I organized my drives. I have a public uh, space. So if I want to create a new drive, it's easy enough. Put the fic photos I want there. And I could post that on Twitter or whatever, or any or, matter most or whatever. People... Or, or public and anonymous, yeah. though, yeah. and free to use. Yeah, actually, it's that's possible too. Because yeah. anyone who knows that public key and has the stack installed can get to it. So I'm showing command line, but there's a beaker browser where you just paste that hyperlink into the, the and you see the, you can see a whole directory or you can have a web page that pulls in those photos using the hyperlink. Hmm. Nice. Yeah, stuff. so this will um, get us dreaming all weekend. Yeah. <laughs> Vincent, I interrupted you. Feedback. I was just, yeah, also the whole like Apple ecosystem is really interesting with photo, how they treat photos because you would assume something like a list of photos is such a simple thing to store in an accessible <laughs> folder, right? It's like a folder with a yeah. list of photos. And um, yet like I have to go through such insane workarounds to like, if I'm in Illustrator and I wanna bring in a photo from my phone, I have to open up like the photos app and like move it somewhere. And it's like, I can't deep link into the photos app because it's not just like an accessible file. It's like a built-in like application, um, which yeah, kind of makes me- uh, Yeah, they're restricting how you I was work. just gonna, Vincent, I don't know if you do this, but um, it, it makes that stuff incredibly easier. I, I'm 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 thinking back to the trade-off you were talking about regarding box, but if you do automatic um, backup to Dropbox and sync to your drive, you end up with and and set your naming conventions the way you want to. You end up with date named photos as files that are you know drag and drop in your 
in your hard drive mm. are all the photos that you have in photos. And I, I rarely go into my photos app because that's where my photos are when I need them and they're easy to find by, by date. Um, you wanna hear how I do it? Okay, so this is a, an Android phone and I tether it to a Microsoft Surface Windows laptop. I just copy all the files off the phone and then I put them on a USB stick and put them in the Mac. Okay, so now here's an iPhone. Um, it has photos and I figured out how I can export from photos into how to, you just do an export, like for videos, I connect my iPad to the Mac and then it opens, it syncs to photos and then I export them out of photos and do what I want with it. Yeah. And where do you and sync it to, Eric? The Mac photos, at, for the iPhone, you have to use an app. So um, I did have the, um, uh, yeah, the iMazing, uh, which uh, is several versions behind, but that'll get it off an iPad or, um, but the, see they're pay, they want you to pay for like more than 50 items to sync. It's just crazy. Mm. So <laughs> yeah, but um, the photos app will let you export. So like when it says um, imported today, you could click a few of them and then say export to, and then um, if, it'll- If the photos app can see your photos, which- <laughs> Oh, that's the first thing, yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Wait. Say that again. I, so I use Google Photos. Um, uh, sort of the way that I, I use Apple, Dropbox. Uh, Dropbox? Yeah. Yeah. Um, does, it, and, does, it uh, you, does it let you name? Does it let you set your naming convention? I have never even tried. Um, yeah. Because I, I mean, like the thing that, one of the things that drives me crazy about um, Apple Photos is the names are just, they're, they're numbers that aren't even enough digits not to cycle around like yeah. every yeah. two years, which is like, what? Yeah. And, um, and Dropbox lets you auto name, you know, in a graduated time stamp. So yeah. that, you know, I mean, that, that, that makes perfect sense and, and, yeah. and makes things really easy to find. All right, so we need something that would get all the Apple files into a hypercore, and then you do your own <laughs> stuff with it. Someday. Yeah. That I might be interested in, yeah. Yeah. Wait, so, yeah, that would, I would be interested in, actually. I'd, buy, I'd pay for that, because mm -hmm. the reason why I didn't just use Dropbox or Google Photos, because Google Photos is freaking incredible, was I when it first came out, I was like, really scared because they were able to like do image recognition they ran image recognition on every single photo and i'm just like great i'm training their algorithm and also they know what's in every single photo and dally's uh, using them now yeah uh, <laughs> yeah yeah and so like i guess my question is how how secure do you guys think Dropbox and or Google Photos is as a place to store your most personal things? Like that was the one thing that I didn't. Tough one. I Google. mean, I haven't, I, I don't know if anybody can share some some horror stories about Dropbox, but in in just, I, I intrinsically, because of their business model, as opposed to Google's business model and, you know, and, and incentives, I don't they there there's no particular there's no motive other than law enforcement you know looking for child porn or something for them to really get into your images so i feel better about dropbox than i do a, a, about google photos um but you know there may be horror stories out there that i don't know i i uh, specifically don't trust dropbox yeah Tell me, tell me about and, that. And it, uh, Dropbox used to be really cool. It was a little startup that got big, kind of like GitHub, and it was somebody, something I, I trusted. Um, they, 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 um, the founders cashed out, uh, and it was when this is going to sound tinfoil hatty, but whatever. Um, it was when they, uh, they hired Condoleezza Rice onto the board that I'm like, okay, I get it. Um, Dropbox is connected in the back end to stuff I do not want to know about, and I don't want to store my files with them anymore. 
they went to Hillary Clinton's server. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, or Trump's. <laughs> I, the the yeah, short Trump's answer is you, you don't want to trust any of the big big ones. Okay. I, re I refuse to pay for uh, storage online. <laughs> like I'll, I'll use the free stuff, but I'll delete it right I mean, away. <laughs> yeah, the the if if you have stuff that you really want to keep private, you want to keep it encrypted and only you know end to end encrypted wherever. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so I don't mind paying that, for storage, yeah. but you know right. the stuff that is really private is encrypted in their but cloud. And... You see what I just showed you? How I can create a hyperdrive store file and then someone else can grab it. Well, that could work for people. If, uh, yeah, yeah. It's the little secret that we're keeping from the world. Hey, Pete, what, what, or, or anybody, what, um, what more trustworthy encrypted, end-to-end -end encrypted cloud storage options do you recommend? Which don't suck. Which don't suck. Um, <laughs> well, the, the weird thing is that the end-to-end -end encryption thing sucks, basically. Yeah. Um, I tried um, Keybase for a while. And the thing with Keybase was they did that airdrop and then they got the whole world onto it just to get the money. <laughs> and I, I mean, it still looks good. I, I mean, it's end to end. Except, except that they got bought by Zoom. Yeah. Oh, OK. Yeah. Um, and I don't think Zoom is going to screw them up, but Keybase is OK. Is Zoom doing um, with anything with them? <laughs> I don't think so. No. Yeah. They just had to have it. Yeah. <laughs> um, Michael, the, to, to focus your question like what kind of files um not well i mean as in, in terms of of bulk and memory uh photo and video is the the largest but you know also graphics files text files just have everything you know just like wanting to have um secure access and and easy back up on the cloud get some so, portable you know, hard drives yeah no, i mean <laughs> yeah, I, I do I know. that you know and i have i have portable hard drives and i have external hard drives you know in in my basement and you know i mean i, I have that stuff but that doesn't do me any good you know sharing traveling that you know and i don't yeah, i know what you're saying uh, yeah how much can you store on your laptop you have to think of it in advance before you're traveling with what you want to take with you right, well, right. So with this uh, if you had your own laptop like i have you store everything on there and then your you have your private directory and you sync what you need so say you're in a hotel you can get to your laptop in your basement and pull your yeah. hyperdrive of the files you want yeah Okay. That's that's how I see myself using it. Like I want to look at the photos ten years ago. Yeah. 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 Uh, sync thing would be similar, and I think it's and and encrypted. See if you could manage your own keys, that's best. And and you you even like with something like Microsoft Azure, you can upload your own keys, and then only you have the private key that you could encrypt with them and then Microsoft will know that it's you. And so, yeah, I mean, it's possible, whatever you want. Uh, it's just, okay, so like, what is the objective of Flotilla again? <laughs> <laughs> As Wendy has been doing, thinking it through. Um, sync thing is probably a pretty good solution for what you're talking about michael hmm. and it, Which, it's essentially the same as hyperdrive conceptually i mean it's not actually not the same at all but i uh, and i'm saying that because i know michael's used sync thing a little bit yeah yeah so this is the sort of thing that you could set up to sync with your photos from apple no either either one of them uh makes it so that uh, whatever devices you want to connect up have access that they, they they'll talk to each other and make sync to the different devices but not um, not to a cloud provider is is there a is there a 
uh, workflow you can imagine for, you know, taking photos and videos off of a device um, and there's it, for backup it's really straightforward there's um, some nice utilities that will do backups make sure that your your stuff is encrypted and in the cloud um, but it's more for backups not for not for syncing sharing uh, Eric you're Eric, you're muted you muted yeah I just shared a hyperdrive with all of you. Isn't that nice? You. you have 64 hex digits now. <laughs> Figure out what to do with it. <laughs> um, Vincent, uh, Bill and I and Michael and, and some folks, we've played around with SyncThing a fair bit. So if you want, it, it's pretty, it's actually really easy to set up. So, but if you want uh, some advice or whatever. Okay, thanks. Get the video of how to set up. Yes, yeah, so you have to keep going back to YouTube to find my stuff. <laughs> okay. And here it is. There's a peer-to-peer -peer YouTube clone or YouTube mm -hmm. replacement, I guess. No, there's no, which one is that? I'm sure there are. I haven't been following them. There, there may be several. I think there's something on I, IPFS. Is it um, PeerTube? Maybe. Yeah, peer, PeerTube. Yeah, that's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah, I'm just beginning to learn about IPFS um, because of that uh, Gordon's talk. Okay. Yeah, that's my video of how I set up the hyperdrive hyperspace. I wonder if they have an API that lets you upload to them automatically. <laughs> Good question. Because um, if so, I would be inclined. Um, I did figure out how to get the um, box um automation working it was like one silly thing um so this is the i have every time a new zoom recording is um finished in the cta zoom it then um uploads to box so this is the like test one that i did um so it uploads here to box and then It'll create a new record in the Airtable here, this test record, and it puts in the share URL. Mm -hmm. And then I have a formula to create the embed code. And this embed code, you can embed in any website. It's just an iframe embed. Um, and this can be synced to Catalyst or anywhere else. And then you can have a gallery of all the videos a filterable like gallery of all the videos um using box as the back end to store them uh, oh the 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 box the box problem that you were having about playing videos that were in box that you solved that is that what you were saying yeah it was actually because i have a personal account and I don't pay. <laughs> so they don't let you preview videos in their player unless you pay. And I just put it in the CTA folder, which is paid and then it works. <laughs> yeah, how do you like when you press a button on your remote and it says illegal? <laughs> I mean, what the hell? I can't uh, fast forward through a preview of a DVD. <laughs> Who's controlling us? <laughs> yeah, so the good thing about decentralized, I could watch those videos without ads. <laughs> I don't have to have, wait five seconds for YouTube. To... <laughs> hmm. We should figure out how to get the flotilla videos to go to PeerTube. 
Yeah, there's a command line thing that you can use to add videos. So you'd have to figure out where to run that, but um, but that would that would do it. I'm like allergic to running anything on my local because I. <laughs> well, yeah. So is that the sort of thing you could server. run on a server? Yeah. Okay. Um, cool. But then you'd have to have a server, you know, that runs it, or or a serverless. You could do serverless too. So with PeerTube, does it depend on peers seeding your videos and keeping them alive? It's a good question. Um, I, I also see a, a thing that. Uh, Another tool is um, uh, S3 st uh, remote storage. So mm -hmm. I, I think you could use S3 to do the seeding. OK. Maybe something like that. Yeah. It's a little question. Who pays for it? Do you pay for it? Uh, no. Yeah. Well, it's uh, so, so for your hybrid drives, you're seeding them off your laptop in your basement, basically. Yeah, so like the one in the basement I keep on. So yeah. and, and I'm that's okay. It's a Linux machine. Um, but I usually disconnect my Macs from the net when I'm not using them. Yeah. Um yeah, for IPFS, there were a couple services that you paid and they'll they'll seed them. Um yeah, I mean. But the weird thing was <laughs> Uh, those, those companies like got started and then they would blow away. So it's like, you know, I, you know, I want to make sure my NFT is going to stay around. Uh -huh. So you start paying this company to make sure they're seeding it. And then the company goes away and you're like, yeah, what's up with that? Well, then just have some other company bring up uh, servers. Yeah. And... Yeah. Yeah, yeah at least that part is like, um, you, you don't like, it's not proprietary or anything. Like it doesn't matter, right? As long as you've got the, the hash. Okay. Yeah, I put dat dot in the chat. That's um, an effort to have like a commons seating where people would contribute bandwidth and uh, storage. And then there would be a smart client that makes sure they're behaving properly, that they're serving files when asked. There's a, I, I forget if it was IPFS or I think it was IPFS. Some, some company committed to storing everything for you know 10 years or something like that well internet archive should store everything hi stacy hey so is, is that something that a town could do like have their own yeah yeah you could use everybody's machines to peer all your stuff together okay. yeah is okay. that sort of what i think um you know what you and i were talking about i think that might fit in with the overall no it has to be planned out. I mean, maybe there should be some centralization as a backup of everything or, but uh, yeah, but peer to peer sharing is easy. It's really the long term. Um, it's how you operate. If, if people are, are, I mean, eventually everybody should have like a dedicated appliance hooked up to their network that just does all the storage and security updates and everything. But for now, it's whatever device you're contributing to the bandwidth of the network. Hmm. Yeah, these things blow, they get in your brain and you start <laughs> thinking all the weird things that you know, considerations. Or we could just use, when you said S3, that's just Amazon's yeah. web service, and, right? Yeah, Storage. and um, there's, uh, uh, it it got popular early, and so there's a bunch of there's maybe not a bunch. There's a number of um, companies that provide S3 compatible storage. So it's it's become kind of a generic thing too. I think Bubble IO uses them because every single image that is uploaded yeah. it has a little colon slash slash S3 at the beginning. Yeah. Yeah. S S. <laughs> it's a weird thing to say, but S3 is like the 2000s version of, of hyperdrive hmm. um, <laughs> because i the the thing you can do with s3 is just throw stuff at it and it just saves it and it's super super stupid the way it does um simple simple stupid not stupid in a bad way 
um, all it does is it's like I'll, I will keep this file and I don't care how, how big or small it is and I'll make sure it's available around the world whenever you ask for it by this hash basically um, so it gets used a lot I mean it's basically like IPFS right in that sense it's it's a yeah it's like IPFS too yeah it's true except that uh, it's it's got um, serverless level agreements. Like you can actually depend on S3 and IPFS. <laughs> IPFS, you have to have something seeding. In IPFS, it's called pinning. Uh, so the big service is uh, pinata. Microsoft has the same things, so service level contracts for different tiers yeah. of storage. Yeah, and Google and storage. Compute. And then there's some some pretty good um, alternatives to, S, uh, to Amazon that have S3 compatible. Mm -hmm. Uh, IPFS is uh, Internet Protocol File System, I think. Interplanetary. Interplanetary, you're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Elon's taking it to Mars, right? <laughs> hey, and and it wasn't just Elon. It was. <laughs> Interplanetary. It was probably uh, Vint Cerf, right? Uh, um, maybe, Vint Cerf yeah. was the first per big person talking about uh, interplanetary uh, internet. Hmm. Yeah, I'm starting to get my head around the history of who did what. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, Vint uh, is a, um, he's he's like OG internet. He's one of the people who started the internet, um, mm -hmm. uh, and then he's been involved uh, with internet in internet governance for the whole way. Actually, I'm wondering, uh, Stacy, have you seen the uh, Jim White Scarver? recently no i spoke to him when i was down in florida back uh -huh. in december and then nice. just a little bit on facebook okay yeah. yeah i'm not sure what role he had um some kind of protocol maybe uh development you mean in the past yeah, do you know what yeah, he worked he would, on? Yes, HTML. Wow. Hmm. He created the blink tag then. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know. Yeah, HTML, that's great. <laughs> it's like the guy who created the ET cartridge for Atari. <laughs> blink tag was somebody else. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> Christopher. I don't know. <laughs> It's nice hanging out with you people. Uh, likewise. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Good chat, folks. Thanks for the, the thorough demo, Eric. Sure. That was fun. Appreciate it. Nice seeing you. Nice seeing everyone. Have a good weekend. Pete and Michael, just a quick reminder. I did. I sent a Calendly for um, us to find a time for the um, debrief of the needs and offers workshop. Um, I'm assuming that we're not doing it this afternoon. So I'm going to like remove that one as an option. Does that sound like a good assumption? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, that was an email, Vincent? Yes. Cool. Yeah, I responded, but, but didn't offer today. So um, yeah, it's good by me. Did, did you get my response? I'm just wondering if I maybe did something wrong. It was it was earlier. Um, let me check. I have it. I didn't check very in the last few hours. Let me see. I don't think I got an email. Okay, I'll see you guys. Thanks, Derek. Derek. Hi. Thank you. Yeah, I, I don't see an email, Vincent. It was a Calendly thing. Never use Calendly as. Uh... I just sent you the link in the chat if you want. Thanks. Pete. Yeah, it's showing. It's showing my. Yeah, link. Michael, I got yours. I got a link. Okay.
thankfully, Jonathan and I did a, a retro after the, <laughs> immediately after the marketplace and um, I fixed the bugs and we did some redesign to the opportunity forum, which was, which was great. But that was only on a technical level. I'm going to stop the recording. Oh, actually, I can't stop the recording because you're the host now, Pete. <laughs> there you go.